Welcome back to the podcast, everybody. I'm honored to be joined by my guests, Ross Rosenberg. How are you today? Dave, I'm doing great, and I'm excited about this conversation. Yeah, really? likewise. Thanks for joining me all the way from Vancouver Island. Well, uh, long story short, originally from Chicago, fell in love with um, a woman that uh, proved to me that working on self-love actually pays off. And it a Facebook conversation turned into a marriage from Chicago mm-hmm. to Vancouver. So I'm, I won't say I'm from Vancouver, but it wouldn't be so bad if I was. Yeah, congratulations. Um, it sounds as if like your professional research influenced your personal life. And um, we we began our conversation talking about codependency, but there's so much more than that. And, and you brought up self-love. So mm-hmm. how did you get interested in how and why what you what you do in the world? Tell me a little <laughs> bit about tell me a little bit of how and why we got here today. I got involved because I was a child to a codependent mom and a narcissistic father. And like um, all adult codependents who I now refer to as self-love deficient, um, they learn early on that their only safety and predictability of getting something, whether it's love or safety from your narcissistic parent, is to mold yourself into what that parent needs. And people like myself, who are adult codependents, they know that you, if you come from that type of family, you are focused on everyone else. Mm-hmm. So, of course, I didn't know the psychological explanation. I was just a kid, but I kind of grew up paying attention to everyone else and feeling more confident or at least less insecure when I tried to help others. And that was kind of the, um, the laboratory of sorts that created what would become my adult codependency. So I been a therapist for 37 years and somewhere in the middle of it, I noticed this really bad habit of marrying narcissists, people with personality disorders. And because I, I prided myself as not having that many problems and I was in complete denial, by the way, Mm I, (laughs) and like a, like a lot of codependents, I really, my, my core shame just, um, just went off, off the rails. Um, and I felt so horrible that I kept meeting, marrying, not necessarily just in marriages, but I kept finding these narcissistic women. And despite any of my, um, promises myself, they were the ones that I just kept finding. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, I, I had this broken picker. Or as my therapist once said, <laughs> I fell in love with the same woman and the different face. Relatable. <clears throat> and, and, or as my dad would say, the, the narcissist, uh, <laughs> he's deceased, but you know, um, what would become a soulmate would always turn into a cellmate. So oh, very well said. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's powerful. That's, yeah. That's, I have to include that line in every interview because everyone loves that. And my, mm-hmm. and it's my homage to my narcissistic father who one could blame or um be given credit for what i know but we won't go there Mm -hmm. Uh so so my drive to figure out why do i do this and and the the therapist that i saw and i'm a big fan of psychotherapy um none of them had a clue and i couldn't handle the pain the shame and so i just committed myself to this journey of trying to figure it out and mm-hmm. through this, you know, through my own dedication, getting lucky in so many ways, I started to put together these ideas that codependents and narcissists are naturally attracted to each other. And that comes from deeper psychological forces. And so that impacted a career that I already had as a psychotherapist. Mm-hmm. Long story short, wrote my book, The Human Magnet Syndrome, the first edition. And now I have a book that's in 12 languages, 150,000 copies, and a YouTube channel that's got 22 million views. And it's become my my, my life's work. Mm-hmm. So that, I believe, I hope I answered the question in that. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, Ross. And it sounds familiar to me through that shapeshifter, yeah. people pleaser, child inside that's like, I need to be somebody else. I need to trade in my authenticity to receive love or safety. Am right. I, am I summarizing? 
a little um, bit about you're, what you're um, talking about? First of all, very close. But if, if you look at the unconscious psychological dynamics, a child who comes into the world, if all things are equal, parents naturally, unconditionally love, respect, and care for them. But if you are, you know, sadly, you come from a pathological narcissist who has a personality disorder, you experience a great deal of trauma during um, your formative years. And that trauma gets represented just like post-traumatic stress disorder. It's represented in a part of your brain that you can't remember, but still impacts you on a day-to-day -day mm -hmm. basis. Mm -hmm. And so self-love deficit disorder, my name for codependency, um, cannot be solved if we don't understand that the most um, pathological, if not toxic part of the disorder, a person can't see. Mm -hmm. and so this drive to take care of others um, is as much conscious, but unconscious. And it's born from an early childhood experience of surviving because that child in the same family could have a sibling that could not figure out how to survive and make mommy or daddy happy, be the, be the, the athlete, the singer, the handsome, the silk guy, the pretty girl. And other siblings could not, and they became the target. And then their eventual mental health reflected something else. Mm -hmm. so, so as much as it is about habits and trying to do things and trying to be things, it's also driven by something that most people don't understand, which is what I is what um, motivates me to teach people because you can't solve a problem if you don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate you clarifying that. And before we hit record, you mentioned that a lot of what shows up in adult relationships is from those core attachments. Yes. And if you could expand on that, um, oh, absolutely. how how a child in this survival mode would have this attachment form and then show up later on in their adult relationships. If you could expand on that, that'd be great. So, and I explain it this in detail in my book. So I'm going to give a, um, a quick answer to that, but human beings like higher mammals, including primates. Um, and there's research all about this is that we absolutely require attachment with our caregivers in order to develop healthy brains that promote healthy psychological functioning. And if you deprive a child of attachment, like if none of it happens, um, um, some might be familiar of, of a um, failure to thrive syndrome where a child won't even grow and their brains will be um, as an adult, one third the size. And if it's complete deprivation, they know that child will die. And I say that is that when you are raised in an environment that is with a pathological narcissist, someone who has a personality disorder, someone who does not understand, know how to unconditionally love, but in, in the opposite of that, they actually hurt, destroy, deprive, abandon. So if you're a child who naturally is hardwired to just be loved just because you're laying there, <laughs> whether you're smiling or you're, you know, you're got a poopy mm -hmm. diaper. And so <laughs> if you have that attachment experience, it indelibly impacts your future, uh, your future personality, the child. And this actually happens as early as, as like one or two years old, that a child can figure out, even though they don't have language, um, you know, before the, they're a toddler as an infant, they can figure out what they have to do in order to get what they need. And that could be smile, that can, you know, say the right things. So if you have a pathological narcissist parent and you are capable of molding yourself to be that the trophy child, the pleasing child, the child that makes the narcissist feel good about himself, you have literally stunted the normal uh, personality development and moved in the direction of creating yourself to be lovable and so that you won't be hurt. So that whole experience throughout a childhood molds a person's personality. That attachment means that you are loved because of what you do, the human mm -hmm. doing versus a human being. Mm -hmm. And that ultimately coalesces or crystallizes 
um, and, and adulthood as this feeling that you're only lovable if somehow you sacrifice, you become, you know, live on the margins, invisible. And so the attachment experience um, of only being lovable if you take care of someone else um, re is replicated in adulthood. And that is what I call codependency, self-love mm -hmm. deficit disorder. Mm -hmm. It's un unfortunately, um, according to the books, media, and tons of YouTube folks, they explain it differently. It's not a conglomeration of bad habits, which all codependents have. It's the deep trauma of, of the lack of attachment and the need to create a self that could be loved and cared for, but not a real self. Mm. Yeah, that that's a lot clearer to me now. And, and it sounds like we're digging into beyond just the terms of narcissism and codependency oh, yeah. that are thrown around a little bit too liberally these yeah. days. And so what was your transition, your own professional transition from that dynamic of labeling narcissism and codependency to this yeah. self-love deficit disorder? Oh, oh, that's a great question. I love that question. So let me first talk about the transition of redefining it and coming up with new theories of codependency, because I always disliked the word codependency. So when I wrote my um, human magnet syndrome book, I just renamed it. I, instead of calling codependency, someone that doesn't have boundaries, that takes care of people, that says sorry all the time, that falls in love with people that don't take care of them, I, I put it as a very simple definition that rests on the idea that personality is independent of codependency or narcissism. So if you and so a codependent is someone who in relationships gives all the love, respect, caring, and trust, expects it to be reciprocated. Um, but because of the human magnet syndrome, they're always falling in love with personality disorder narcissist. They don't get it and they stay in a relationship. And the narcissist is a person that needs, requires, and demands all the love, respect, caring, and trust, has no intention of uh, being reciprocal and mutual, lacks empathy, um, lacks compassion, and is able to get that because of the human magnet syndrome. Mm -hmm. So that was my first step in creating a simple definition. So one day when I was just thinking about, I need to replace this name. And it was really because of my own personal development and about self-love and the importance of self-love. And it hit me. I almost fell off the chair. It just like it was like a thunderbolt. Self love deficit disorder. This is exactly what is the primary problem, consciously, of every codependent. It's a name that has the problem built into it. And with that, in a matter of probably six months, I realized that this is a problem that, if successfully treated, according to its um, constituent components, you know, the trauma, the shame, pathological loneliness, it can be cured and cured permanently. Uh, just like if you have an infection and someone gives you an antibiotic, mm -hmm. it cures it, um, except an infection can come back. And so, so maybe that was a bad example. <laughs> so then the, the goal of treatment, my, which was my self-love recovery treatment program, is self-love abundance. Mm -hmm. And then you never, ever experience self-love deficit disorder. You have self-love. You're not perfect. You still make mistakes. But that all that stuff that created the fire inside of you that um, burned until you fell in love with a narcissist, it's been neutralized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. And before we jump to like the treatment plan and the treatment that you came up with, uh, can you... Tell me a little bit about what pathological loneliness looks like. Yeah. That was, you know, there's a couple, I, I love to create new names for things, not because it's just fun, because otherwise I think I would become excessively annoying. Uh, no, um, but I like to, create, <laughs> um, you know, but I like to create names that better explain someone's experience. So AKA self-love deficit disorder, self-love abundance. Um, so if you look at self-love deficit disorder, SLDD, and you imagine a pyramid, 
the foundational cause is attachment trauma. We already talked about that, the trauma mm-hmm. being raised yeah. by narcissists and codependent parents. The next level is core shame. From that trauma, you develop this, this identity that you are inherently broken, not good enough, not lovable. And the only way to feel safe and lovable is if you sacrifice yourself for someone else, not sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice your needs. Okay, we don't go that far. That's not right, that's another right. problem. Um, and then from core shame is pathological loneliness. And that is this existential bone aching, literally physical and emotional pain where you feel that if you're not in a relationship, you're just kind of floating in air and, and your self-esteem, you, um, your, your feelings of safety all fall apart. It's this intense loneliness that if you are an SLD, self-love deficient, codependent, they have this, this pain of loneliness that is really a parallel experience of their childhood that they mm-hmm. don't remember it because it's more unconscious. And the only way that pathological loneliness goes away is when you're in a relationship. So the next step on my pyramid, attachment trauma, core shame, pathological loneliness is addiction, codependency addiction or SLDD addiction, where it is this compulsion to be in a relationship to make the loneliness go away. And when you understand it as an addiction, then you understand that pathological loneliness then is the withdrawal symptom. Mm -hmm. Then from that addiction, at the very top of the pyramid is all the traits we know as codependent. And there's many, many traits. So pathological loneliness is that bone aching pain that only goes away if you're in a relationship. And you Mm -hmm. don't always understand what it is because it it represents what has been, t- uh, I think Freud called it repressed. Some people call it unconscious, but um, people that are, are trauma informed, they, they refer to it as dissociated memories. So you can't really remember that loneliness as a child because it's buried. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough situation that, that really, if you don't know about and don't have a plan to overcome, makes it almost impossible to stop being codependent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, if you could summarize SLDD in one paragraph, like you were alluding to earlier, oh, how sure. would you quickly? How would you quickly summarize that in one paragraph? Uh, um, a self-love deficit disorder is a um, a chronic relationship and individual mental health disorder that requires you to give up your identity, yourself, and any feeling of of self-respect to another person who you believe, you mistakenly believe will love, respect, and care for you, but doesn't. And you get stuck because of your fear of being alone. Mm -hmm. SLBD is a trauma-based disorder. Codependency is a trauma-based disorder that perpetuates a person to relive their childhood in the relationships as adult and to like the child always wanting to be loved, respected, and cared for, finding that that person is unable to and getting caught in what I call this hamster wheel experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. <clears throat> uh, you referenced earlier that there are habits or behaviors of a codependent or self-love de- deficit individual. Uh, what does that, what does the, what do those habits look like? Um, one of the things that um, um, I, I'm proud of and I created was, um, and this is kind of a newer idea, something over the last four or five years, is that personality is independent of someone's SLDD. So you can be what I, I'm going to get to the question, but I got to go this way. So you can I appreciate the I, expanded version. I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how to answer simple questions. I apologize. Maybe one day. I, and I don't ask yes or no. I Yes. Uh, when I'm when I'm dating, I'll get this feedback of like, "Wow, Dave, that's a loaded question." Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm like, "Heck yeah, it's a loaded question. I want to know. I want to know everything about it." And I'm making assumptions, but prove my assumptions wrong. So, yeah. let me hear it. <laughs> okay. And actually, I got to say, a lot of people they'll say, "Hey, how are you?" And I actually will take some time and answer it. And and I learned early on that that annoys people because they don't really want to hear. It. They're just like just saying, "Hey, fine, good, fine." And yeah, they're I trying to be polite. Answer, 
<laughs> yeah, I answered the question. Okay, so now you got to ask the question again. Sure. You were talking about how habits show up for somebody oh. who's codependent or with SLDD. And I, I asked, what, what does that look like? You know, how does that show up? Yeah. And so, so I created personality profiles that represent uh, codependence because if you think that a codependent is what I call a passive codependent, who like doesn't fight is a martyr, gives to every, like my grandpa would give everything to everyone and just not complain a lot and just kind of suck it up. Well, what about the person that is trying to control another, trying to change them, uh, trying to get what they want and not getting it and staying in a relationship? Going back to my definition, a codependent is someone who gives all that love, respect, and care and trust in a relationship, don't, doesn't get it and stays in it. Mm. So that represents a passive and active. And then I created other other names, uh, and I won't necessarily go over it now because I want to answer your your uh, habit question. So once you have an idea of your codependency personality type, then you understand that you're you have all these habits. Like a passive codependent's habit is they don't talk at all and they always say they're sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so if if you are an active codependent, you are always trying to help someone even when they don't want it. You are always trying to control people that don't want to be controlled, that can't be controlled. You are reflexively saying sorry. If you're talking about something that bothers you, you sometimes will smile. Um, when someone asks you what you want to do, you get confused and you immediately turn it over to the other person. And when they, and let's say they're not an, a narcissist, which according to the human magnet syndrome, you won't be very attracted to, but just for, um, <laughs> but if they're not a narcissist, you just get confused because you don't, it's not your comfort zone. The passive codependent is afraid, hunker down and their safety of just shutting everything down. But ultimately the habits are reflective of the way self-love deficit or codependency manifests. Um, and there are um, there are a lot of uh, parallel between some habits, but what I want to say to your viewers, listeners, is that if you identify with my explanation of codependency or self love deficit disorder, and you have these habits that you've gone to therapy and and no one has been able to help you break, it's not because there's anything wrong with you, and it's not necessarily because of a therapist is not good enough. It's because you and your therapist don't know what the problem is. If you go into therapy and you want to talk about, you know, about, you know, why, you know, why do I stay with this narcissist? They never get down to the real cause of the problem. And, and I promise you, Dave, if you start asking people who are codependent and you define codependency the way I did, I am positive that a great majority of them will say that they still have the problem, but they've had to like not think about it because the pain of it is too much. Yeah. And you were, you were talking earlier about like, uh, not treating the habits, but looking underneath the hood. Mm -hmm. And you were, you were talking about self-love abundance as being a part of your treatment plan. So let's, let's talk about connecting with your, your client who might be a self-love deficit disorder person and you're working with them, how do, you, how do you work them through this treatment plan that you've created? So first of all, I refer to this work as a treatment program. And so I have to reorient uh, the clients who are seeking my help. Uh, this is not regular psychotherapy where you can say whatever you want and it goes as long as you want and I'll always be supportive. This is like if you're an alcoholic or have other serious psychological problems, if you go to a treatment plan, treatment program, there's this plan, a theory, um, a set of goals that drive it. So what I do is, um, the first thing is I do is I screen anyone who wants to be involved because the, I haven't yet reached everyone in the world. <laughs> Thanks to you, maybe I'll reach a bunch more, but a lot of people <laughs> misunderstand codependency and um or have different ideas i also require and i'm kind of loose on this but i require them to read my book but it's not to make a few extra bucks um it's because 
I don't want to waste their hard-earned money by teaching them everything so that we can move forward on the therapy. So the more information they know um, about the human magnet syndrome or what I call the codependency cure, orients them towards my program. And that's where my YouTube channel and I have a, a website, Self Love Recovery Institute or selfloverecovery.com, where I have available all of my educational resources, the, the full length resources, not the short ones on, you, on YouTube. And once someone has at least a basic understanding of it, um, I have this 11 stage treatment program that is beyond the scope of, of this talk. But, you know, I have information about it at selfloverecovery.com. And every stage is required to get to the next one. And the first stage is, and I only go to the first two, is hitting bottom um, and finding hope. There's not a lot that I do um, in that stage, but the second stage is about, the, um, I call uploading all important and relevant information to understand your codependency, your SLDD, to understand pathological narcissism, and to understand why you've subjected yourself to narcissistic abuse and don't even know it. But part of it is talking about habits. So it's not all talking about what happened when you were a child and your trauma or your pathological loneliness or core shame, but is to be aware and mindful of what your habits mean. Um, that when you say sorry all the time, you are broadcasting to most people in security. And if you think about chemistry, you know, if someone says sorry all the time or always apologizes, you know, and someone who's not a narcissist but is is healthy, according to the human magnet syndrome, there's there's it's gonna feel awkward. Mm -hmm. Or habits of not knowing how to be kind to yourself, be supportive of yourself, and actually thinking about what to do or how to do it. So those habits, whether they're related or um, rooted in gaslighting, or they're related to dysfunctional thinking, working on those habits, the mechanics of those habits are really important, like cognitive behavioral treatment. But it also has to be connected to proceed and go after the other more deeper, what I would call psychodynamic elements of codependency. Mm -hmm. uh, that. I believe would be its own a podcast episode at some point, just to dig into that, you know, the, the treatment plan it. and those, and those first two levels. And while I have you here and before I let you go, cause I know your time is valuable. If we could define self-love in this context, what, what does that look like? What does that sound like? And why would, why would somebody want to be really interested in giving themselves self-love? Self-love abundance is when you have, unconditional love, respect, and caring, and trust for yourself that comes from you naturally that is self-perpetuating. Because you have it, because you experience it, and if you're an SLD or a codependent and you spent a whole life not having it before, you'll do almost anything not to let anyone take it away. So it is a self-perpetuating feeling of love, respect, caring, and trust that not only fills you up and guides your life, it's also imperceptibly or unconsciously and explicitly communicated to others that draw you closer to other people. The human magnet syndrome draws healthy opposites together, whereas, and it also draws the codependent and the narcissist opposite together. And so someone that has that self-love abundance engenders other people with that to not so much be attracted like in, in a romantic relationship, but be attracted more in a personal relationship. Yeah. And it sounds as if that relationship starts with yourself. You, you know what? I know there's a great saying here, but I, I'm not recalling it, but oh yeah. Yeah. I, I knew it's the one I say to almost every client. And sometimes I forget and I say it to them three or four times. If you're on a plane, what do they tell you? Put the oxygen mask on yourself mm -hmm. first before your child, because you're no good to the child if you pass out mm -hmm. without oxygen. You have mm -hmm. to take care of yourself so you're able to take care of other people. 
one of the core fundamental understandings that you were referencing earlier is that we need attachments. You, you need the, um, I call it a relationship template that comes from a secure attachment in childhood. And from there, you want the type of attachments that are familiar. And so if you're codependent or an SLD, you seek in the wrong areas. But if you're healthy or you are becoming healthy, you need the type of attachments that represent who you are. Um, and absolutely, I mean, what is life by living alone? It's not all about just loving mm -hmm. yourself. You know, I think excessive self-love might even be narcissistic, but it's about experiencing that in, in a world where people give as much as they take and don't hurt you in the process. And mm. if you're an SLD or codependent, you spent the whole life not knowing what that is. And once you get it, you're not going to give it away. Mm, yeah, very well said. Uh, so before I let you go, if you wanted to leave us with one thought that we touched on that we didn't quite get to, uh, what would that be? Well, one of my favorite uh, sayings comes from George Eliot. It's never too late to be the person you should have been. And if you're out there and you identify as self-love deficient or self-love deficit disorder or codependent, you don't have to be like my mom and some of our parents or some of ourselves. A lot of my clients are in, are in their mid seventies. Um, you don't have to take your codependency to your, you know, to your grave. Um, it can be solved. Find a person to solve it. And if your therapist doesn't understand it, I have, I've been training therapists. That's actually where I started as a professional trainer. Have them read my book, have them go on my selfloverecovery.com website or educate yourself so that you can find a way to get help. Yeah, thank you very much for that. And uh, if people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, um, everything about me is at selfloverecovery. Dot com. Any questions you have or comments about um, this uh, podcast, write us an email at help at selfloverecovery.com um, or just Google my name, Ross Rosenberg. You know, I, I got enough links out there that you'll find your way to the, to the website. Mm, yeah. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll be sure to put those in the show notes below. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me because I can tell that we've I can just get the vibe that we speak the same language and we are um, both share the um, almost excitement of teaching people this stuff. So, mm. so thank you very much for having me on the show. Yeah. Thank you very much for that reflection. And, and it rings true for me. I really appreciate you saying that even though we just met today, mm -hmm. I do feel really aligned with the way that we uh, approach our, our messages and, yeah. and I can't thank you enough for coming on the podcast today. You're welcome. Well, you take care, Dave, and I hope that we'll do this again. Thanks, Ross.